my goal surrounds like the idea of love. Like how can we create a more loving society? How can we incorporate love in everything we do? It is really important to choose leaders who understand what we're fighting for, who understand why do we need to protest. Hey everyone, welcome to new podcast series of Here Quiz Stories. Stronger Together Amidst Adversities in Southeast Asia. Brought to you by Came Out of the Closet and Asian Sogi Caucus. A series of podcast episodes which will be made available both in our Spotify account as well as in YouTube. It's intended really to bring so much space for LGBTI voices from Southeast Asia to be heard, to share our stories, and also to find out how folks like us will be able to work together in transforming the ASEAN region. Welcome to our podcast series, Here Quiz Stories. Listen to the LGBTIQ narrative from Southeast Asia in collaboration with ASEAN Sogi Caucus, where Farah, Proud and Greece. This series is on Stronger Together amidst adversities as the queer community in a time of pandemic in Southeast Asia, covering six episodes and featuring multiple queer guest speakers across the region. And today is the sixth episode of the series. We will be discussing the topic around the struggles of queer youth activism in Southeast Asia. Today, we have Elijah Tay, who's a Singaporean youth activist known for their LGBTQ plus advocacy and founded My Queer Story SG and Queers of LH. Elijah has protested in the hashtag Fix Schools, Not Students movement. Currently a sociology undergraduate at the Nanyang Technological University, NTU. And Wincy Gallo from Philippines, pronounce she-her, is a transgender woman teacher and writer in her country. Currently, she's a teacher fellow of Teach for the Philippines and deployed in Taliban Elementary School. Let's start with the questions. Can you both share your journey in activism in your respective countries? Why don't you go first, Elijah? I started dabbling into activism since I was around like secondary two, so I was 14. I wouldn't say like it was full out activism per se. It was just like gaining that awareness and like try my best to use the space that I have, especially online platforms, which was safer for me at the point in time because I feel like closeted. So online spaces to spur conversations about topics that could be seen as controversial, especially in Singapore, relatively conservative society. And I think the defining moment for me in like activism was when I was 16. So when I started my queer story SG, having this like platform for people to share their stories of discrimination with the option of anonymity so that people realize that, hey, this is a problem. We need to like, be mobilized to like do something about it. We need to repeal Section 3 and A and beyond that, there is an urgent need for shifts in various policies as well, like more inclusive and comprehensive sex ed, fair media representation and whatnot. You know that a lot of non-Singaporeans have this picture of Singapore of being very progressive and it's mind-boggling for them to think that LGBTQIA plus rights is a different story. How Singapore portrays itself on the surface is very different from how marginalized groups experience life in Singapore. And I think the idea of like progress or like being like so like forward thinking often ties in with like how Singapore functions as a, I would say, neoliberal society. So when we talk about progress, when we talk about like or advancements, it, it often has to do with like economic advancements or like technological advancements. There's barely anything that has to do with like say advancements of like human rights or like advancements of like how do we make it a more inclusive society. It's yeah, more often than not, these like progressions have to do with what can generate profit. Yeah, I think that's really true because a lot of people, you know, when always they think Singapore is like a boom boom bow. So in terms of your activism, Elijah, what do you essentially plan for like my goal surrounds like the idea of love like how can we create a more loving society how can we incorporate love in everything we do how can we leave the world a better place than we were brought into i think that's like my central philosophy in life so i think that guides my activism as well what can i do 
in my personal capacity, we can shift in society to make it more inclusive, right? What can I do to support marginalized groups? Not just to like uplift them, but to dismantle the systems that are oppressing them. That is my goal in activism, to make the world a better place than I was brought into so that the generations to come are able to enjoy, to live, you know, just exist unapologetically without worrying about the things that I had to and like other marginalized groups have to as well. Yeah, I think that's really, really nice. How about you, Win? your youth activism in the Philippines? In the Philippines, in the present time, especially during election time, because election is fast approaching in the Philippines. It's on May. It's on 9th of May. And do we, why do I need to discuss this? Because youth activism now in the Philippines, you can really see youth participating in rallies especially in during pandemic that um we are limited to have physical activities but in online everything that you can imagine they're doing that just to promote a leader that su- supports equality competent leader that my country really be now and yeah in the past few years here in the Philippines we read tagging is the priority of the government <laughs> red tagging <laughs> in in us in the activists so um it is really important to choose leaders who understand what we're fighting for who understand why do we need to protest why do we need to have these different types of activism because we saw something that it is in need of change and as a transgender person transgender woman i stand for the lgbt community for for my community, um, as you can, well, it is not a secret that three of my siblings were all part of the LGBT community. We're a rainbow family. So advocating in it is not just thinking of myself. There, there is a hope for progress for the generations to come, these hundreds, these thousands of lives that will be affected. And if anything, I think my more immediate concerns were what, how my family would would they be affected by my arrest and such a public like thing being put out there? Yeah, I mean, it was really brave of you to go out there, do this for us. Vin, so you advocate for, you know, in, uh, inclusive workplace and, and jobs for the trans community that's free of discrimination and biases. You know, what were challenges that you faced while you were doing this advocacy in Philippines? Oh, actually, it took me two years to face my own fear, being judged as a trans teacher. So two years of questioning if I am really worthy to be a teacher because this is, for me, it is a new concept in the Philippine education wherein a trans person will be a teacher. And it's not just for me, it's for it's also in the community a new phase of teacher. We will be facing a new phase of teacher. And I am not sure if they are ready for that change, for that it formed a lot of questioning. The challenge is more on myself, not on the society, because it was given at first that um, you're questioning yourself because the society is also, they're questioning you if, are you really worthy? Are you, are you really sure with this profession, with this, with, with your passion, but if you really wanted to become um, the person of your dream, because I really, because before I'm a teacher, before transitioning, I am really a teacher. And I can really imagine myself doing another job other than teaching. I tried to find jobs wherein I can say that there is no discrimination with a trans person. But the thing is that I am not comfortable. I am not let's say there is something missing in me. So um, I go back to teaching and fight it out with an organization where at the end of the day, it was not that really a requirement to fight it out. It was, you were just testing me if how committed I am with my passion because I need to be ready within myself because I will be putting in a community where in being a trans teacher is new in this community. So you need to be ready. Are you really committed? And if you're really committed, then go. So also juggling with this advocacy, you really, I really need to reevaluate myself from, um, from time to time. Because like there are a lot of 
challenges along the way that I am facing, the question also, my own advocacy, if I can really stand this one or or I'm just doing this because a lot of things. So, yeah, it's more on myself than the society itself. If there's a challenge, it's in me dealing with my own questioning mind, my overthinking mind. <laughs> So, you know, thank you for whatever you're doing at your workplace. This brings me to my next question. Elijah, do you feel the need to self-censor yourself um, in the thread of, you know, persecution whenever you discuss certain topics like on social media or, or anywhere? And what and do you think that there are dangers that comes from being silent about it? Right, I think like there is definitely a level of self censorship, right? Like, especially with like the new like FICA in place, uh, for interference, uh, countermeasures bill, um, that essentially like suppresses um civil society voices because of the big terms and whatnot, and also like the POFMA that was passed in like twenty nineteen. So there is definitely that like pressure to like self censor or be a bit more careful or mindful of what we are saying in fears of like, I don't know, like offending the authorities and like facing possible prosecution. I think like often like that's at the back of my head. So like I also don't really care. <laughs> and then like I'll just say whatever I need. <laughs> like I, I think uh like just speak my mind. I'm quite an open book. Um so if people like ask me about my opinions, I'll just like share and like even if it's like staunchly like against the state, right? Or like what the current state policies are in like oppressing uh, marginalized groups. Uh, I think my self, my form of like self censorship is not so much in the words I say, but like the platforms that I can use. So like say, um, for uh, like we use messaging apps that are like have a certain like higher level of guarantee to have like end to end encryption and like privacy like settings. Um, when discussing like more sensitive issues, and also for like video calls as well, video calls messaging that kind of thing but in person uh, not really la. like <laughs> when I'm like chatting with people or whatever like I'll just like speak my mind and uh, I think I'm quite lucky also that I've like immersed myself in a crowd that is generally more open-minded even when we like disagree with certain stuff we can still have like conversations uh, that allow us to understand one another's like perspectives so yeah I don't I don't feel the overt need to self-censor but uh, when I'm in more conservative space I'll be a bit more like careful I'll like try to test water first before I like say anything that could be branded as like too like radical or like I don't know they like to use the term like social justice warrior right <laughs> like yeah I guess there is that level of like self-censorship yeah because I want to say that you know like people like to say social justice warrior oh you're too radical I, I always get all of that when I talked about race, because you know how race is a very sensitive topic in Singapore, it's super, super, super duper sensitive. Whenever I talk about it, I get like super duper nervous. I'm like, who's going to screenshot my IG story and like going to put it out? I hear you. I think like that there's a balance that needs to be struck, right? And there's no like clear, like definitive answer, like, oh, is it gonna be like a bad thing if I subset? I mean, censorship, I think generally is something that we can agree is like bad, right? Like if we, we want people to be able to have the freedom of speech. But I think when it comes to like um self-censorship, like recognizing like the OB markers, recognizing the possible like face of uh, it's important also to recognize that we are not responsible for like putting out certain information or putting out certain like takes at the risk of like our own safety. Like if you're looking out for your own safety, I think like that's what should be the priority. Uh. Like if you don't like take care of yourself, if you don't look out for yourself first, then like how are you going to like share these thoughts like in time to come? If you get like shot down now, how are you gonna like continue to have that platform? So I guess it's also like um, considering how to like safely dabble these spaces. And yeah, but also at the same time, like there is advocacy for like freedom of speech, right? For free speech. And I think that's important as well. It really depends on like what your capacity is. And like not everyone is obliged to do everything, right? Like in advocacy, in activism, like uh, you choose like which form of activism works best for you. If you have the capacity, you can protest. If you have the capacity, you can email the MPs, you can email like the president. You can go down to the Istana to hand a letter. You can uh, share your opinions or like reshare like content on social media. You can have like, it could be as simple as having conversations at your dinner table if you have like the capacity, if you have like the privilege to do so. So I think like activism and advocacy reflect in different forms for different people. 
Yeah, la, I think it's important to recognize that it's like it's it's a community effort, it's a group effort, and you don't have to like place the burden onto yourself. Um, but of course, like if you have the privilege to like, of course, like yeah, step up la. Like for me, like as a Chinese person, I think like it would be easier for me to like talk about race because like it's not like it's not something that like directly affects me. Yeah, I think that the word here, you know, I think that you pointed out was privilege will bring me to the last question later. Um, you know, it's really important in using a privilege and whenever you have it, and, and I think a lot of us, uh, we are aware of the privilege that we have, you know, but more often than not, you know, we decide to stay silent about it or we don't want to use it. So whenever you have that privilege, definitely go out there and um, do use it to your maximum um, potential um how about when do you feel like you know when you you know in, in your in your line of field do you feel that you have to self-censor yourself well i wanted to start that i am a teacher so whenever i speak my truth and realities in public especially in public or posting in facebook and instagram or whatever i say in front of my my students, it took me a lot of time to reflect and revisit everything. So it's very important because, because sometimes we are, we are, we put in that place that um, there are things that it is, yeah, somehow it is a need to be shared. But sometimes there are also things that we need to reevaluate and revisit and um, choose what are those things that we need to share in public, especially that. I cater or my audience or um, specifically my students because because they're close to me. They are they can see my post. I am I'm, I am a public person to them. But everything in this everything in this process, especially in transitioning, it must be shared for uh, for me. It, it must be shared for everybody because if you will not share this, who will do the job for the community? Especially that if I can really remember last year when I started um, as a teacher fellow for the teach for the Philippines, there are one specific trans sister who messaged me that she was truly admired of the action of taking the risk in becoming a teacher because she, she really wanted to become a teacher, but she was just have that fear to have that um reservations because oh yeah because of the society itself that uh, here in the philippines tra- being trans teacher is a really new in the society so that really also reawakens my my desire to wow let me share this experience let me share this on facebook let me write a story in this let me write a poetry in this well i find it very simple way especially if you're just sharing your story, the impact of those who are reading your stories, reading your status, or seeing your pictures in uniform, it's really big. So also, if there is any fear, I guess, no. The same with Elijah. I don't have any fear of prosecution. I don't know. But yeah, as long as I know my rights and I know where I will stand, I don't have any fear <laughs> as of this moment. I, I just learned the term of risk assessment, but I, I, I term it reflect. I mean, I reflect and revisit, especially when I am using terms, like, like a new term or let's say um, not so child-friendly term, wherein my, my learners can see my posts. So I am more specific on that, saying if it is appropriate. To, to what a child can, can be seen in my post. <laughs> okay, this brings me to my next question. So, Elijah, how do you stay true and be resilient in advocating for youth activists despite the struggles and the possibility of receiving discrimination? I think actually the reality is that like I'm not strong all the time. Sometimes I do feel burnt out. I think it's important to acknowledge that as well. Activism is tiring, especially with all these barriers that we are trying to break through and like trying to cross to dismantle these systems, right? Or I even start to question and like introduce conversations about all these like systemic issues and like societal issues. So how do I stay strong? 
I don't. <laughs> I burn out sometimes. I cry sometimes. <laughs> I'm tired sometimes. And that's okay to acknowledge. But I think like overarchingly, I'm still driven towards advocacy, right? I don't know. I guess like the dream of seeing a space where like we wish we could have like grew up in being like brought in for the generations to come. I think that sense of hope, that sense of like, hey, we could build like a world that... I just really wanted to support Elijah with with the answer of thinking where are you coming from? I mean, if it is from the place of love, then go back on that and pursue what you what you love. But for me specifically, my first step in doing being true to myself is that I am being mindful with my stand. I evaluate that. I reflect on that. And um, because it has a huge impact in my life personally, but at the same time, on your audience, on the youth that you're influencing with whatever you're sharing is. So there's more on giving your ser- yourself realities of entering a life with a purpose, especially now that this is not just uh, I'm having a, a, a huge backpack wherein I really wanted to bring my community um, in an exclusive place wherein we don't need to think about fear, we don't need about we don't need to think about things that we need to consider because we wanted to become a teacher, we wanted to become this, we wanted to become that because we have this dream. So I really wanted to open that space to them. So second is that know your grounds. Where are you standing? Um, are you in the right place? <laughs> After giving space for yourself, now you need to evaluate also the society, the community within you. Are you stepping in a space of others? Are you invading other rights with your advocacy? Um, this is more on your impact to others than impact to yourself. And last, being you, being me, being me, and I can really say that I am being in a right place now because I feel that I am safe. Also pursuing to share the things that to be shared. And yeah, it's this is too personal. Um the question revisited my my experiences for two years of not having a job because you're just having that concept of fear in your mind that you will not be accepted being a teacher. And it's too personal we're in my sibling, especially now my sibling, as she is now transitioning also and becoming a, a woman. So I don't want her to experience what I experience. I really wanted to clear a space. I really wanted to get those blocks, roadblocks. They will just come in and they will just enter in that specific space. So yeah, thank you. Okay, this brings us to our last question for both of you. In Singapore, race ties in with, like, class also. I think, um, despite being, like, middle class, like, I'm still, like, a Chinese person. I still have privilege as a Chinese person to have access to resources that minority races do not have. So, um, I, I was in a SEP school. And, like, back then, like, I didn't know anything about, like, race or, like, inequality. I didn't know, like, shit about society like, when I was choosing schools as a P6 kid. So I was like, oh, near my house. <laughs> I just go for that school. Then, um, yeah, so I think, like, definitely there have been resources in the school that have allowed me to, I don't know, like, uh, study with um, these materials that, say, like, other schools might not have or, like, school facilities that I could use. So I think these have definitely contributed to the learning um. I don't know, the learning prospects that I've had. Lah. But at the same time, also, like, as a trans student in school, I wasn't entirely comfortable. So there's that, like, I don't know, like, disjointment also. Like, if I was a cis Chinese person, I think I would have thrived in the school, right? Like, with all the resources, with all the, like, the, the staff to, like, student ratio, the extra funding that, like, SEP schools have and all that. But also, like, with the gender policing and all the, like, I don't know, I would say, like, trauma that come from, like, being shit on by teachers and, like, students because of my gender expression and gender identity. I wasn't able to, like, enjoy these privileges per se or so, at least in the school context. But also, like, I recognize that in, like, existing in general, um, like, when I order, like, um, food at a hawker center, right? If they talk to me in Chinese, I can just respond in Chinese. But, like, if they 
hope to like someone of a racial minority like they might not be able to like respond as well and I think a lot of like hawkers are too comfortable with like using Chinese as a default also to like uh, ask like oh what do you want to order or like to like address people that kind of thing so there are privileges in the day-to-day also and also in accessing um I guess job opportunities as well for me like personally I haven't applied for like those typical part-time jobs so like uh but I have heard from friends who have like applied that like oh they require them to like speak in Mandarin which I'm like "Mm, they're just like selling bubble tea why do they need to speak in Mandarin I'm pretty sure the customers speak in like all language or in like English at least yeah so there are these like barriers to entry in terms of like material resources and uh I think how privilege plays a role in like my life is that sense of I guess like not having to experience the racial trauma that uh, my minority friends have to undergo that, that that is tied into like my Chinese privilege right like the material resources that I have access to uh, learning materials and whatnot not having to worry about I don't know like getting extra tuition because like uh, like what I had in school was enough and whatnot so um, this gave me like a greater capacity to be able to uh, put, pour in more effort into advocacy, right? And uh, I have more, like, energy to, like, devote to advocacy because I didn't have to worry about those things. So I think that's how my, like, relationship with, like, my privileges are, uh, or at least, like, my privilege as, like, a Chinese person and, like, an able body person, being able to, like, access, like, events um, that are, like, like, say, like, it's at, like, the top floor and they only have stairs that kind of thing. So there, there is like accessibility, like privilege, there is a race, being able-bodied. Mental health, I don't know, I'm not diagnosed, but like I think I feel relatively okay <laughs> so far. Um, yeah, so I think that there are privileges that allow me to have a greater capacity to put forth my efforts in the realm of advocacy and activism. Yeah. How about you, Win, in the Philippines? Being a Pinoy, um, I can really say that Filipinos do accept change. Like um, it's it can be sin. It can be it's very evident. It's evident in the society. And it, and if you're accepting change, there is progress. And it is a testament now that um we are trying to normalize things, especially normalize trans people. Trying at least we're trying. At least we're having that steps of trying. Um, like for example, taking space. Like for example, now being me in it, it is a huge impact. Impact and at the same time, it is a bold step for for an organization to put me in in this field wherein it was a, a really big question before. If do really trans people can, but now I can really say that tolerating me to become a teacher is. It's a, a huge privilege for me to do what I love, and, it's, and at the same time to share what to share the story of this. Like, um, it will not just end by me, but it will it will be transferred from others. Yeah, and at the same time, I can really say that the noise are accepting change, and it is a privilege for me to to do this, to take my part now, to do my part now in in doing awareness and. In pursuing this and sharing whatever my experience is, is to normalize everything. We definitely so. learn from Win and Elijah on their takes on advocacy in their respective countries of Singapore and the Philippines. Thank you both for being a part of our podcast, and this itself is a type of advocacy. Having conversations on this podcast is a stepping stone in mobilizing change. We really appreciate your time. That's a wrap of our last episode of Hear Queer Stories. Don't forget to follow Elijah and Win on their social media platforms. For Elijah on Instagram is at Elijah Peng. And for Win, it will be at underscore MawiKit. Thank you for listening. Follow us on Instagram at Came Out of the Closet IG and Asian Sogi Caucus. Catch the video on our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Stay tuned 
for our next episode.